So this week's Torah portion is Shalach Lacha, and it's send for yourself or send yourself. Now what are we talking about here? We come to the point in the story where they're about to enter the promised land. But first, we want to check it out, right? We want to, what are we getting into? Okay, what's the land like? What are the inhabitants like? These kinds of things. And we have some situations that evolve out of that. But as I was going through this Torah portion, like I do all the time, I say, you know, Lord, what is, you know, we can go through the facts and figures of each historical record, right? What is there for this week? What is there for us? What is there for our time? Okay. And the thing that popped out to me was presumption. Presumption. We talk about in this Torah portion, there are some situations that happen where people take action based on presumption. Okay. So trying to quantify this. Often we have an assignment that's given to us, right? I need you to do X, Y, or Z, okay? And so we take it upon ourselves to accomplish this assignment by using methodologies that are within our own viewpoint or stem from our own agendas, okay? Rather than the agenda or the viewpoint of the authority that told us to do this thing. So what are we talking about here? Because I'm throwing a lot of words around. Basically, we can be given a mission and assignment, and we can do that in a wrong way because we're not operating in the right context, right? We're trying to accomplish the goal, but we're not operating in the correct context. And when we do that, we're operating outside of authority. We're working in our own authority, not the authority that sent us. And it's easy to find ourselves in this place because we're going after what we're told to go after. We're doing what we're told to, to have done, right? But we're not going about it in the appropriate manner. It's presumption. Now, what happens when we find ourselves entangled in this? We seek forgiveness, right? Now, we've talked about this before. We can receive forgiveness, but forgiveness does not necessarily negate the consequences of our actions, right? When we submit to the authority, whatever that authority is, that authority reserves the right to dole out or withhold punishment, right? In like fashion, when we submit to the Lord, he retains the authority. Does he want to let us experience the consequences or does he withhold us from them? Parents, we do it all the time. Our kids get out of line and then we have to make the choice. Right. Am I going to allow you to suffer the consequences of your actions or am I going to step in and preserve you from the consequences of those actions? That's parental discretion. We see this in this Torah portion, in this Parsha, that we have an example of sin, repentance with intercession, forgiveness, and the consequences of those actions. Now in the historical context, we're going to see how that played out for the people. So, starting in Numbers chapter 13, we'll read our opening verse. And it says, Adonai said to Moshe, send me on your behalf, send, excuse me, send men on your behalf to reconnoiter or spy the land of Canaan, which I am giving to the people of Israel. From each ancestral tribe, send someone who is a leader of his tribe. And this is where we kind of tie in this whole assignment thing. Okay? This was the assignment they were given. I need you to check the land out. Send a representative. 
So we have the famous story of the 12 spies, right? We've all heard this story many, many times. The 12 spies were sent out. Now who was sent? It was one Nasi or prince or representative of each tribe. It was the head of each tribe, okay? They were sent out. Now, just a few Torah portions back, we talked about the census, right? And we had all these uh, leaders, right? The heads of these tribes. Here's a, a little bit of conjecture here. Um, but if we look at Numbers chapter 1, um, verses 5 through 16, we have a list of names of all these leaders, all these heads of the tribes, right when they did the census. And then now we're just a few a few chapters away, and these, get, these guys are getting sent out. Um, the conjecture is that this is possibly um, the 12, uh, the men that were sent out were possibly those same individuals, with the exception of two people. And we'll talk about that. But that's a little bit of conjecture. Can't, can't prove that one way or the other, but I thought that was very interesting. Now, it's also interesting to note that the tribe of Levi was exempted. Because if we remember, the census was taken for those who are able to go to war, right? Those who are able to fight. The tribe of Levi does not go into battle in that context, right? Nor, um, they were also exempted because only tribes that would inherit the land were sent. The Levites don't have an, a land inheritance. Their inheritance is the Lord. It is serving the Lord. That's their inheritance. Okay, so they were exempted from this group. Um, Numbers chapter 1 talks about how they were exempted from the census of military service. They had their own census in, in another sense. So that's kind of the opening, right? So we, we pick these guys. These guys are handpicked, each one to represent their tribe. And you've got to remember the tribes, thousands of people. They pick one guy to represent. He's representing everybody. It's a lot of pressure right there. And he's given a mission. So there's some weight and gravity to this. A lot of times we think, you almost want to think like in military terms where we have sent out a, a squad of people, right? It's just pick, pick you know, J squad over there and send them out to check it out. And you know, if they come back, great. And if they get shot up, well, whatever. <laughs> you know, it's just, it's, it's, you know, it's like, the, it's like the B team or something. These were the top guys. These were the head guys. And they were representing everybody. There was a, a serious weight to go and check out the land. This was not a small thing. So, before we get to the spying out of the land, Hosea, he was one of the ones that was picked. Okay? He was chosen from the tribe of Ephraim. Now this was one of the two discrepancies from that list of names that we talked about. Um, then again, that's conjecture. That's, that's just a possibility. But Hosea, his name literally means the Lord has saved. Okay? Past tense. Chosen from the tribe of Ephraim. Moses, before he sent him, he renamed him Yehoshua, or Joshua, as our English trans, uh, translators have uh, coined it, which means the Lord will save. So we go from past tense, past tense to future tense. This is interesting. Now, of the two discrepancies from that, our, our conjecture list there would be Joshua and Caleb would be the other name. Um, but it's interesting, this whole renaming. What happens when we see a biblical character get renamed? He goes from one character, it speaks to his character, really. He goes from one character type to another. Okay? Now, we know Joshua ends up leading the people after Moses. Right? This is interesting because... Um, our scribes would, sell, would tell us that Hosea was a very humble man, and yet he becomes the future leader. But there had to be a character change. Now, it's interesting because if you look at the Hebraic spelling, there was a, a yod was appended to his name. And the Talmud tells us that this was appended to his name to remind him 
that yod He vav He must come first. Right? So I'm going to put the Lord in front of you. And I'm going to make that part of your name to make sure you always recognize this. Do not go and undertake this mission in your own power. The Lord must go before you. Okay? This is key, and we'll see how this plays out. So this, this was a, again, this was a serious thing to go out and uh, reconnoiter, to use the fancy word, or spy out the land. But he wanted, Moses wanted to make sure that he knew that the Lord must come first. Now, the mission. What was this grand mission to spy out the land? Well, the scripture tells us from, from the passage they need to determine the strength and number of the inhabitants, right? We need to know who we're going up against and how many of them there are, right? He wanted to know the type and the structure of the cities. If you're talking about a military incursion, right? Because what did the Lord say? You've got to go take the land. The land's yours. I'm giving it to you, but you've got to take it. Right. You're not just going to waltz in and it's there. There's people there already. You have to possess what I've promised you. This is a theme that we need to remember in our lives as well. What promises has the Lord made us? And if we do nothing, how many of those promises do we obtain? Versus if we fight and strive and press towards those promises, how many do we obtain? So, strength and number of inhabitants, structure of cities, they want to know, okay, what kind of fortifications are we coming up against? And, this is really interesting. Let me see if I can find this here. Um, what kind of country they're in, what's good of it, what kind of cities, whether the land is fertile, whether there's wood in it or not. Oh, this is a little different translation. So mine says whether there is wood in it or not. In the Hebrew, it's are there any trees in the land? This is interesting. Why do we care about if there's trees or not? Right? We've been told it's a land flowing milk and honey. You know, it's an abundant land. Trees are kind of a given, right? Why are we concerned about the trees? Um, this there's wood in the land is not a great translation. See, trees, we're not talking about natural trees. We're not talking about wood. The trees is a reference to a righteous person. So what do they want to find out? From a military perspective, what are we going up against? And are there any righteous people out there that we need to be aware of? Right? We're not talking about wood. Let me see if I can find this passage here. Psalms. Yeah, people that in the land that were righteous and faithful to the Lord. Psalms chapter 1, verses 1-3. Psalms chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. How blessed are those who reject the advice of the wicked. Don't stand in the way of sinners or sit where scoffers sit. Their delight is in Adonai's Torah. On his Torah they meditate day and night. Verse 3. They are like trees planted by streams. They bear their fruit in season. Their leaves never wither. Everything they do succeeds. This is what this reference is talking about. Are there any trees in the land? Are there any righteous people who are serving the Lord already in the land? Right? We need to be aware of these people. Um, Jeremiah 17, 7 through 8, very similar reference. I'll let you look that up. So that was the mission. Let's go check it out. Right? Can, can we take the land? What do we have to do to take the land? It's promised to us. It's ours. We have to take it. And are there any righteous in the land? So the spies were sent out. 
And they go all through the land. They're checking it out. They're checking the people out. And they finally, they come back. And they have their report. And everybody's waiting for this report. Because this is the last step before we go into the land. So we're waiting on their report. The report of the ten spies concluded that it would be impossible to conquer the promised land. Look, guys, we checked it out. It's awesome. The land is great. Look at this fruit we bought. I mean, we had to bring grapes. The two dudes had to carry the grapes back, right? This is amazing. It's a land flowing with milk and honey, but there's these people there. There's giants there. They live in fortified cities. You know, they're intelligent. We can't do it. We just, we don't have what it takes to enter the promised land. Sorry. That was a report of the 10 spies. Caleb and Yehoshua, they didn't subscribe to that. Caleb said, no, we can, we can absolutely, we can do this. He was that guy, right? He's that guy, come on, we can do it. Let's go, guys. We got it. And everybody's looking at it like, you're crazy. No, we can't do that. He's like, no, yeah, we can do it. Come on. Right? It's interesting, when I was studying this out, I stumbled across some, some commentary, some rabbinical commentary, and it kind of goes like this. It says, one should ex exercise human effort in the, uh, should exercise human effort in the context of reliance upon God for the outcome. This points us directly to Caleb's response, right? Look, we can go and do this. God promised us we can take this land. Let's go. What's the holdup? Right? I'm going to do everything I can. I'm going to bring my A game. You know, I'm going to sharpen my weapons and I'm going to get ready. And I'm going to use all my tactics and all my skills. We're going to go and we're going to take this because God is with us. Just like David and Goliath. What did David do? He went out and he saw Goliath and Goliath had everybody stopped up. But he's like, have you seen him? He's a giant. We can't take him. What did David do? He went and got stones. And he says, God is with me. We're going to take this dude out. End of story. Caleb, similar spirit. God is with us. He was of the tribe of Judah, interestingly enough. So the sin of the spies was essentially this. This was their error. Lashan hara, the evil tongue, right? We've talked about this in the context of gossip, you know, so saying things about people behind their back, etc., etc. But it was, Lashan hara is speaking evil by producing an evil report. Now, why was this an evil report? Did they report anything that wasn't true? In the, in, in the sense that they talked about how the land was and they talked about its inhabitants. Right? There was no falsehoods there. Why was this Lashan Para? Because they said we can't go in. We couldn't do it. The report was ultimately a rejection of God's promise to bring them into the land. God promised the people. He made a covenant promise. I will bring you into this land. If you are my people, that land is yours. And what did they say? Oh, we can't do it. Essentially what they were saying, God can't do it. God can't bring us in there. Have you seen how strong the people are? They were saying the people there, the inhabitants there are stronger than God. Because they'll take us out if we go in there. Yeah. It's a rejection of God's promise. Essentially, they were saying, no, I think God's lying to us. Because we've seen the people. We've seen what it would take, and we don't have it. The sin was committed by a representative of each tribe. And as a representative of a people, 
you carry that weight and that burden, your decisions affect all those you represent. Just like with any leadership position. Right? If you're a leader in anything, your decisions affect those you lead. These were the princes of their tribes. These guys were supposed to be the best of the best of the best of each tribe. And when they sinned, just like when Adam sinned, we all get to share in that. All the tribes shared in that sin. So even though a single person sinned, the majority would suffer for those sins. More so, not just because of the sin of the men, because the people believed their report. That's where it got sticky. It'd be one thing if the men said, no, we can't do it. And people said, no, you guys are crazy. God promised us. I'm not believing what you're saying. We're going to go do this because God told us we can't. But the people said, oh, they're the best. They're the princes. They are our best representatives. And if they say we can't do it, we can't do it. They believed the report. When they, when they believed that report, they co-signed the report. Right? They entered in that sin of Lashon Ha. So Moses sees, he's like, okay, we messed up. The people messed up. This is not good. God's position is like, look, you guys don't want to go on the land, I'll just take you out. I'll start over with Moses and we'll we'll find a new group of people. Because these yokels, you guys, you guys don't want you don't you don't want it. You know what I mean? It reminds me, again, raising kids. There's times you want to do something for your children, but because you don't give them all the information, they resist. Right? Look, I want you to get up early tomorrow because I got something planned. So you're going to get up extra early, you're going to have to get ready, and we're going to hit the door. Oh, why do I got to get up early? Why do I got to do this? Right? And they resist and they push. And they don't know that you planned on taking them to some fun event and you had to get an early start because you had to drive for a while. Right? You kind of want to make it a surprise. I don't know, all these things, but they resist. And so what do you do? Sometimes you say, you know what, forget it. Don't even worry about it. And they find out later, oh, you were going to take me there? Yeah, I was. Not anymore. This was God's position. He's like, look, you don't want it? Fine. We'll take these people out and we'll start over. Moses is like, whoa, hold on. Let's take a time out here. So Moses begins interceding for the people. How does he do this? Because he knows they messed up. Right? God knows they messed up. Moses knows they messed up. How do you intercede for somebody like that? Moses interceded for the people on the basis of God's reputation. This is very interesting. He didn't say, look, you know they're kind of hard-headed, you know they come out of Egypt, and they still got some paganism, and they got old habits. He didn't, he didn't try to do it, he didn't make excuses. He said, God, look, your, your reputation is on the line. The emphasis of the intercession was that the nations would cite the very same subject of the spies' report, that God is not strong enough to bring his people into the land he promised them. This is what Moses was saying. He's like, look, God, if you don't bring them in, if you don't bring these people in, what are all the nations? Because they're watching. They heard what you did over in Egypt. And now they heard how you brought all these people out with a mighty hand. And signs and wonders. And you lead them in a cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night, and your presence is with them, and they're all out in the wilderness. Right? And yet you can't bring them into the promised land? What's everybody going to say? They got a strong God, but He's not that strong. His appeal was upon a short uh, was based upon a shortened uh, version, uh, a shortened 
version of the 13 attributes of God's name. So we have to go all the way back to Exodus 34. Let's go back to Exodus chapter 34. And in Exodus 34, just to get some context, we've got Moses is on the mountain, right? He's getting the tablets. Um, he had just he had just said, Lord, let me see your glory. And God's like, you can't, you can't do that. I'm going to put you in the cleft of the rock and I'm going to pass by. All right? So we're right after that. And he tells Moses, come up to the mountain in the morning and I'm, I'm going to meet with you there. And so we pick that up in Exodus 34, verses 5 through 7. And so Adonai descended in the cloud and stood with him and pronounced the name of Adonai. Adonai passed before him and proclaimed yod heh vav -Hey, yod heh vav -Hey is God, merciful and compassionate, slow to anger, rich in grace and truth, showing grace to the thousandth generation, forgiving offenses, crimes, and sins, yet not exonerating the guilty, but causing the negative effects of the parents' offenses to be experienced by their children and grandchildren, even by the third and fourth generations. So God, in a sense, reveals his glory to Moses, and then the next, the next scene right after that, I'm going to tell you what my name means. I'm going to reveal my name to you. Okay? This is where we get the 13 attributes of the Lord from. Well, in, the, in our portion, this Moses cherry-picked a lot of these attributes and said, God, look, this is what you said about yourself. If you don't take these people in, then your word is not lining up here with who you say you are. Let's look at the 13 attributes. Adonai, the compassionate source of all life. Right? Now, we notice that it said Adonai twice. So Adonai, the compassionate source of all life, attribute number two is Adonai. He remained compassionate even after man's sin. Thus, now, thus it, it being repeated. So he's compassionate source of all life and remains compassionate. El is God Almighty and Omnipotent. He is merciful, which is the Hebrew word, word racham, which from two words, rachamim, rachamim, if I'm saying that correctly, is mercy, and rahem means womb. So it's mercy and womb combined to this uh, racham. If the womb, and this is the, the thought process behind this, if the womb is the source of life, then the Lord is the source of mercy. Right? A womb can produce life just like God produces mercy. It's just natural. The fifth attribute is gracious, and that's hanun, Favor given freely to all of creation, right? Reminded the scripture, you know, the Lord causes the sun and the rain to, to, to fall down on both the righteous and the wicked. He is long-suffering. It's erech apim, slow to anger and patient. He's abundant in love, rab hased, right? to both the righteous and the wicked. Again, that, that passage about you know, the rain and the sun, you know, all these things, on the righteous and the wicked at the same time. He is truthful, Rav Emet, faithful in carrying out his promises. Most like God, look, if you don't carry out your promises, people are gonna say you're not truthful. Right? Now this, it's Notzer Hased La La Alafim, and that's retaining love for thousands of generations. Right? We sang it tonight. Thousands and thousands of generations. Okay? He retains love for thousands of generations. It doesn't run out. 
Attribute 10. He forgives or carries away iniquity. Just like we had the scapegoat, right? You place your hands on the scapegoat, you pronounce all the sin, and then it gets carried away. That's avon. And iniquity is perverse premeditation. So no se avon, to carry it away, to forgive iniquity. He forgives transgression, pesha. And that's a rebellious spirit. So no se pesha, forgiving transgression. He forgives sin, het. Inadvertently committed. So these are things that sometimes we just, we mess up, right? Not paying attention, didn't know. So, no se hata'a, forgiving sin. Now this, this, last, this last attribute, a lot of times we talk about, oh, the, the love, the grace, the mercy of God. And we forget this last attribute. He told us in the scripture, back in Exodus, he revealed his name. Right? We can define God however we want, but the only real definition is how does God define himself? Right? right? That's the one that counts. This nahe, he will not cancel the punishment for the guilty. God says, look, I've got grace, love, mercy, right? I'm so merciful that it's like the womb, right? Mercy is just coming out of me. But don't forget, I'm not going to cancel punishment for the guilty. Again, he's the authority. He reserves the right to whether we experience a consequence for our sin. So, Moses appeals to God on this, on this basis, on the basis of his very name. He says, look, this is who you said you are. If you don't bring these people in, hard-headed as they are, the people are going to start questioning who you are. Your reputation's on the line. That was the basis of Moses' intercession. So what was God's ultimate response? We'll go to Numbers 14, verses 20 and 23. And Adonai answered, I have forgiven you as you have asked, but as sure as I live, and that the whole earth is filled with the glory of Adonai, none of the people who saw my glory and the signs I did in Egypt in the desert, yet tested me these ten times and did not listen to my voice, will see the land I swore to their ancestors. None of those who treated me with contempt will see it. But my servant Caleb, because he had a different spirit within him and has fully followed me, I will bring him into the land. And uh, he entered, and it will belong to his descendants. So he's, look, I'm going to bring the people in, just not these people. You guys are going to have to hang out for a while. I'm not taking you all in. Your kids can go. So I'm going to fulfill my promise that the, you, you're, this people that I made a covenant with will enter this land. But you guys, this is a consequence for your actions. You want, you want to say that it was impossible for you to enter? Guess what? Out of the words of your very mouth, it is impossible for you to enter now. Your children will inherit the land. You will not. You doubted me. And so God granted forgiveness for the people, yet laid out the consequences of their disobedience. They went into exile. Their entry into the land would be delayed for 40 years. An entire generation of people would not go in. A new generation of those people would. In verse 32 and 35, we see, we get a little more detail. Let's start with 31. It says, But your little ones who you said would be taken as booty, then I will bring them in. They will know the land you have rejected. But you, 
your carcasses will fall in this desert and your children will wander about in the desert for 40 years bearing the consequences of your prostitutions until the desert eats up your carcasses. It will be a year for every day you spent reconnoitering or spying the land. So every day that the spies and those representatives were gone, he says one year for every day. That was the sentence. An entire generation. God retained the right via his very name to offer mercy and forgiveness and the part we always seem to forget, yet by his very name, he does not let the guilty go unpunished. Now this is interesting. This is the whole reason we need a Savior. Right? Adam sinned, he fell. We are spiritually cut off. We needed a Savior. Because Adam's sin passed down through mankind, right? That has to go punished. That, that has to be punished. He's guilty. There has to be punishment there. He delivered him and Eve deliberately rebelled against God. Right. They chose to believe the words of the serpent and not the word of the Lord. There has to be punishment. This is why we need a Savior. God, in His grace and His mercy, provided a Savior for us. Somebody's got to die and pay for this sin. It should have been us. We're the guilty ones. But because God is merciful, He has mercy coming out of His womb. Right? He gives birth to mercy. He said, look, I'm going to send my son. He will take that penalty for you. But somebody's got to pay. Somebody had to pay. Because of my very name, I cannot let the guilty go unpunished. Because if I did, I wouldn't be just and I wouldn't be righteous. Right? Right? What do we say about a judge who lets a guilty person go free? That's an unrighteous judge. By my very name, I have to punish them. They're guilty. So I says, look, mankind is guilty. But I tell you what, because I'm so full of mercy, I'll send somebody to take their place. So Moses intercedes for the people. The people's response is very interesting. Now, let me see if I can find this. Um, I didn't write that passage down. Oh, okay. Uh, chapter 14, verse 39. When Moshe told these things to all the people of Israel, the people felt great remorse. Then they arose early the next morning, came to the top of the mountain and said, Here we are, and we did sin. But now we'll go up to the place Adam I promised. What was the people trying? They were remorseful. They said, look, we messed up. We're going to repent. Okay? And in their repentance, they said, look, we don't believe those spies. We're going to go in now, right? We messed up. We believe those guys. We don't believe them anymore. Let's go in. The decision to go back in was made presumptuously. This is this issue of presumption. Without God's approval, right? When they were to go into battle, they were to send the ark in front of them. They didn't do that. Why? Because... One, the ark wasn't going to be released because God never told the Levites to release it. So they didn't have God's authority to go in. And Moses told me, he's like, look, don't do that. That's a bad idea. 
God already told you. He already told you what the consequences of your actions were going to be. Don't try to sidestep it now. Right? I understand you're sorry. I understand you acknowledge you messed up. You have to bear the consequences. You know? I'm sorry, son, you didn't want to get up early. We're going to go do that fun thing, but you messed it up. You're not going. It'd be like the kid trying to go himself. <laughs> you know? It doesn't work. And so Moses, he's like, look, there's no work. You don't have my blessing to go in. And they said, well, we're going to go in anyway. And so the very first battle for the promised land, what happens? They went in, and they got their butts whooped. They lost a lot of people, and they got driven back out. And it, it, was, a it was a disaster. See, the first battle for the promised land was done in the strength of the flesh. They presumed that I could just repent, receive forgiveness, and I don't have to deal with the consequences. And I can just march on like nothing's wrong. And God says, you can do what you want. My hand's not going to be on that mess. It was a disaster. Because of presumption. Nadab and Abihu. Presumption. I'm part of the priesthood. I can enter the Holy of Holies. Even though there's standards and precedents set in place. Nope. It didn't work out. Now that's our Torah portion. And as we move into Numbers chapter 15, we get this sudden shift. Right? It's like you're watching a movie and all of a sudden they cut to different characters and different time and place and there's like a whole different thing going on. And we're like, oh, what just happened? Because this doesn't seem to even tie in with the movie I'm watching, right? <laughs> but then they develop something over here and it brings it back and it ties in, right? So that's what the Torah portion is doing here. So we have this story that they lost the battle and then all of a sudden we start talking about regulations and various commands. Almost like we're... Um, you know, like we're uh, reading Leviticus or, or Deuteronomy or something. Right? It was like, so this is weird. Numbers 15, verses 14 through 16. He says, If a foreigner stays with you, or whoever may be with you throughout all your generations, and he wants to bring an offering made by fire as a fragrant aroma for Adonai, he is to do the same as you. For this community, there will be one, be the same law for you as a foreigner living with you. This is a permanent regulation throughout all your generations. The foreigner is to be treated the same way before Adonai as yourselves. The same Torah and standard of judgment will apply to both you and the foreigner. So it's interesting. Most of like, look, there's one law here. It's for you and all the people who identify with this community. The foreigner, the stranger, if they're hanging out, then this law applies to them. And it's interesting that he's going, he's reiterating all these things, right? Because we had the golden calf, we you know, got our second set of tablets, and he's like, I've got to tell these people again, because they're not listening. We had a mission, we, we botched it, we dropped the ball, and now we have to deal with these consequences. So now while we're all stuck here, Let's review some things. Right? There is one law. He says, if you're out here, there's one law for everybody. So for the following generations, the preeminence of the law was established. Furthermore, that law carries over to the foreigner or whoever would dwell with God's people. Because remember, it was a mixed multitude that came out. Right? Right? Furthermore, adherence to the law became the identifying factor of the community of faith one ascribed to, right? So if somebody was out there in that wilderness and said, no, I'm, I'm with these people. We we'll say, okay, well, you're going to fit in with this tribe and put you over with this tribe. You know, you're related to this guy, so you're going to be in this tribe. And they got everybody all situated. And I said, but look. No matter what tribe you're part of and what your roles are and different things like that, 
there's one law for the natural born and for the foreigner. If they're going to be living with us, they can't have separate laws. We do the same thing in our country, right? right. We open up our borders. You want to come in? That's fine. You come in, but look, we've got a system of laws and structure in this country. Right. It might be different from where you're from, but when you come here, you got to buy by these laws. Otherwise, there's going to be some problems. And that's what's being reiterated here. And as we go through, we talk about different um, offerings and different things like that. Um, one that was interesting in this, um, when we went to Shava Oak, um, there was somebody that actually, uh, one of the ladies there, when they were blessing the hala, she reminded us, and I had, I don't know, I just missed it, I don't know, this was new information to me. And so I went, but when I went back and then we saw it in this Torah portion, I'm like, oh, there it is right there the whole time. But Numbers 15, 19 through 21, let's read it here, because I think you'll find this very interesting. This is the Hala Mitzvot. Numbers 19, where are you? Um, let's start with 18. Uh, Speak to the people of Israel, tell them, when you enter the land where I am bringing you, and eat bread produced in the land, you are to set aside a portion as a gift for Adonai. Set aside from your first dough a cake as a gift. Set it aside as you would set aside a portion of the grain from the threshing floor. From your first dough you will give Adonai a portion as a gift through all your generations. Now this lady was telling us, she was like, you can make bread, but if you don't separate a portion, it's just bread. It's not hollow. It's not an offering. Right? There's a difference. So you're to take the dough, take a, a piece of dough out, and set that aside as an offering for the Lord when you make your challah. Typically, if you look online, they say challah is the braid, braid of bread. Yeah, it's not. It's, it's more bread, than that. But it's more than that. It's when you separate yeah. a portion of that and give that piece up to it. So you cut out just a little piece of dough and yeah. you set that aside, yeah. and then you braid it. That's what makes it challah. Yeah, so we, that was new to me. I, I just, I mean, it's, it's there the whole time, like so many other passages, you know, just sometimes you read over things and read over things and you never see them, and then one day you're like, oh, that's been there the whole time. It's amazing. Here we are. So we've, we've been starting to do that now, and I was kind of stressing out because I'm like, okay, got this separate portion of dough. Even Kate has pointed out to me. She's like, well, I got the, we separated the dough and it's sitting on the window, so what do I do with it? And I'm like, I don't know. What do we do with it? Because I'm like, I don't want to throw it away, right? It's the Lord's bread. You know, this seems kind of sacrilegious. You just toss it in the garbage. But what do you do with it? It's not baked. You don't need it. You know, what do you do? No, I, I, don't, I can't take it to the Levitical priest up the road. Um, so I, I actually reached out to some people and did some research. And what most uh, people who observe this command, what they do is, uh, it's, it's funny. Um, they'll actually take it and they'll, they'll separate it when they bake their challah. They'll take the dough and they'll throw it into the back of the oven and just let it burn. So... Now, I don't know what kind of smoke that I'm, I don't know. <laughs> so, I, like cooking over like an actual fire. Yeah, I'm like, oh, that's interesting. So, but that's, that's what you do with it. But I thought that was interesting. A lot of things go as like a burnt offering. So it would make sense that it would be burnt. Yeah. Yeah, it's very, very interesting. So, but I thought it was interesting because there's a command to separate a portion of the hala as a gift to the Lord. Right? Um, we talk about it it's, was often given to the Levitical priesthood, um, and then today they burn it. But the thought behind maintaining this practice today, and this goes back to renaming of Joshua, is to remember the primacy of the Lord, to keep him first. Keep him first. Look, when you're making your bread in the promised land, take a piece off for me. Right? Remember me in the mundane thing of making bread. Maybe it's not so mundane. If you think about it, who's the bread of life? Right? right? Who gives us our daily bread? We remember him by separating that portion. Take a little piece out for the Lord to remember him, to put him first. 
Just like Joshua, look, I'm going to change your very name. I want you to put me first in everything. So that's the challah mitzvot. So remember that next time you ladies are making your challah to separate a portion of the dough. <laughs> then we get into this um, sin offering, which this is pretty interesting. It starts in verse 30. Steve does or we do, or sometimes we just get the dough from the store and break it off. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's actually what this other lady did too. And I was like, oh, I don't feel so bad for doing that. <laughs> <laughs> There's no restrictions on where you get your dough from. You just, nope. <laughs> um, where is it? Uh, verse 30. It says, but an individual who does something wrong intentionally, whether a citizen or a foreigner, is blaspheming Adonai. That person will be cut off from his people because he has had contempt for the word of Adonai and has disobeyed his command. That person will be cut off completely. His offense will remain with him. This is interesting because this goes right back to the sin of the spies. Which equates their sin with blasphemy. Right? God said, I will bring you in. And they said, no, nah, I don't think you can. An intentional sin that is equated with blasphemy. Much like the sin of the spies, disbelief is not only a form of rebellion, but of blaspheming God's name, hence Moses' intercession on the basis of God's name. Because look, most like, look, you guys, I don't think you recognize this, what you did. You're blaspheming God's character. So I'm going to intercede on your behalf, and I'm going to remind God of his character that you guys were smearing by saying he can't bring us in, or we can't do it even though he promised. Then we're given this example of the consequences of disobedience. Because remember, this is kind of like a review of some of these laws, right? And then we go through all this. Moses gives, the, gives some more law to the people. He's like, okay, let's pay attention, guys. Let's get it together, right? Let's not mess up anymore. And then what, what's the very next scene? We cut to another scene, and we have a new guy, and it's on the Sabbath, and he's collecting wood. He's collecting sticks. He's working on the Sabbath. And people are like, oh man, look what this guy's doing. Right? We're already stuck out in exile for 40 years. My, opi my opinion, they were looking for somebody to take something out on him. <laughs> right? And here is this guy, he's collecting, he's collecting sticks on the Sabbath. They had to deal with it. His disobedience was sin. And in his example, sin brought forth physical death. Now we know sin today can bring physical death or spiritual death, sometimes both. Right? There's sometimes we can sin and we won't experience physical death right away. Or at all. But we experience spiritual death. Because we're separating ourselves from the Lord. And just like you separate a plant from water, it doesn't die right away. Right? right. Stop watering your plants. Mm -hmm. First day they're going to be green. Second day they're going to be green. The fifth day, they might get a little bit of brown on them, but they're still green. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. Then the tenth day, they're more brown. And it just goes on, parts start falling off, then they wither up, and then they're completely dead. Not always. Sometimes you can revive them. <laughs> I've tried. That's a, that's a good point. And sometimes it happens to us too, right? You're like, look, I've been, I've been messing up. I've been cut off from the Lord. And so now I need some revival, right? I need the Lord to come revive me. And he comes, gives us the water of his word, and we start turning green again. But just because we don't experience death right away does not mean that it's not there. It's by degrees. And so, just like we said before, this underscores the need for the Savior. Because based on God's name, it's like, this is who I am. You've got mercy, you've got love, you've got forgiveness, you've got grace. But I can't let the guilty go unpunished. I just can't. Somebody has to pay the penalty. 
but I tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to send my son. He'll take the penalty for you. All right? You guys messed up. You're going to be stuck out here in the wilderness. But in my mercy, in my grace, and in my forgiveness, your children will receive the promise. All hope is not lost. We get another command in Numbers 15. And we bring this up from time to time about tassels, the zit zit. And this is where we get the command to wear tassels. And I thought I would touch on this um, because as we've been studying Hebrew, um, we've got some new insights here. And I thought it would be uh, beneficial to share it. So, in the command to wear tzitzit, it says, Tell the children of Israel to make for themselves tassels, right, on, on the corners of their garments with a cord of blue. Well, the children is Benai Israel. And then when it says make for themselves, themselves is Lahem. Both of these terms are the masculine plural term. And this is why you get some community to say it's just for the men to wear the tassels, just for the men to wear the zitzits, because these are masculine plural terms um, in the Hebrew. And so that's the orthodox view is that the command is for men. They say it implies that. Now it's interesting, um, Strong's, if you look up, uh, which one was it? Um, Benai Israel, um, Benai, they say that means son. That's kind of the primary. It can also mean nation, subject, child, daughter, or people, according to Strong's. I thought that was interesting. Secondly, there is no prohibition for women to wear tassels. And we see this in more liberal congregations, right? In the Orthodox, you would never see an Orthodox woman wearing tassels. In some of the more liberal um, congregations, you would. There's no prohibition. And I thought, just for sake of argument, I'm, I'm kind of throwing these things out there for you guys to digest. But our position here is that it is appropriate for somebody who says they observe Torah to have an outward sign to that fact. Okay? And this is why we say you should be wearing tassels. This is our position. So is be, it, it, go ahead. Is it just during service or to wear it out in public? I would say everywhere. I mean you, you see that's where you, you see other other communities, that's they wear them everywhere. Right? And, you know, there's, you know, some people like longer tassels, shorter tassels, some people like, you know, all four and a little thing that wears on their butt, whatever. The point being, it's an outward sign that identifies you with a community. And in that context, that's why we say it's appropriate. Right? This, this is something that if you're going to identify with a particular community, then why would you not want to identify with that community? Yeah. Right? Yeah. It's like, it's like, um, it's a good example. Biker jackets. Yeah, exactly. Right? So if I want to be in a bike, in, in, in a, in a, with a group of bikers, I want to wear the accrut accoutrement to show that I belong to that group. Yeah. But now, that's, so that's our position here. Um, but this is interesting. Because I'm, I'm going to throw some more language at you guys. Um, so hopefully I can make this clear. So this term to spy or reconnoiter, to spy out the land, right? Um, let's look at chapter 15, verse 39. It says, It is to be a zizi for you to look at and thereby remember all of Adonai's mitzvot and obey them. So that's the primary purpose right there. Right, the primary purpose is to remember the commands so I, okay, look, oh, God's got commands. I, I gotta follow his will, his ways over and above mine, right? That's the, the primary function. Secondly, we would say that it identifies you with a group or a community of people, right? It's an outward sign. But it says, it is be a zizi for you to look at and thereby remember all of Adonai's mitzvot and obey them. 
so that you won't go around wherever your own heart and eyes lead you to prostitute yourselves. Now this is interesting, because what are we talking about? Presumption. Your own heart and your own eyes lead you. Right? I'm going to do something. I'm going to go where the Lord told me to go. Even though we messed up, we're going to go, and go into that promised land. My own eyes, my own heart led me and we, we ended up getting destroyed because of it. Because it was out of the will of the Lord. Presumption. So verse 39, when it says to follow after or spy after, depending on what version you have, in the Hebrew that word is tataru, to spy after. Right? This is an interesting tie-in because what are we talking about? The sin of the twelve spies. It means to spy, describe, or reconnoiter, right? To spy out, to search out. It's the very same word used back in Numbers 13, 32, when he said to go spy the land. It's the same word, tataru. This is a reminder, the tzitzits are a reminder, to not fall into the sin of unbelief as the spies did. So it's not just about the commands. It's not just an outward sign, I belong to a particular group. It's, look, don't fall into the sin of unbelief. God promised us something. Don't, don't side with stuff that says, no, that's not going to happen. That's unbelief. Borderlines on blasphemy. This is to help us remember that. A tool. So what's the challenge? Do I follow my perception, my flesh, or God's perception, his understanding of things? See, this is interesting because we go through life and things happen to us. And we say, well, where was God in that? Right? Things happen. I've got to respond this way because this happened to me and this is how I'm going to handle this situation. Okay. What's God's perspective? God's looking down and says, okay, this, this thing's going to happen to him and this is, what, this is what I'm expecting him to do and then he went off this way. Because we had a flesh-based perception. We had a flesh-based understanding. We were looking into the land and we saw the giants there. And when we saw the giants, we completely forgot that God told us that land is ours. We have to remember, remember, we see those giants. Oh, I see the giants. They're big. God told me, that's our land. I'm going to get it. That's the challenge that we face. Whose perception? Whose version of the facts am I going to believe? Right? Based on what? Do I go based on what my eyes see or based on what God says? That's our choice. Another interesting note, according to rabbinical commentary, is that the tassels represent the four expressions of redemption. That's why we wear four. We talk about the cups, right? We do this every Passover. The four cups. I will take you out. I will save you. I will redeem you. I will take you as my own. These are reminders. The four cups. I thought that was pretty neat. I did not know that before. But that's, you know, we're, we wrap that up. And I think, I think it's interesting, based off the story of the 12 spies, that they concluded with, this command to wear tassels. It's like, wait a minute, the people just got exiled for 40 years, and you're talking about strings on our clothing? What's the deal with that? You've got to remember, put the Lord first. His perception, His will, His ways. Not what I'm seeing with my natural eye. Because His sight is way better than ours. He can see things that we can't even understand. So we've got to go by what he's saying, not what we're seeing. 
Because if we operate in the flesh, how many of us have done that? Operate in the flesh. Respond to something in the flesh. And we get all messed up. And then we're crying to God. What happened? God's like, look, you don't see that in my word. And yet, that's how you responded. And you wonder why you got messed up. The half Torah is Joshua chapter 2, verses 1 through 24. And this is interesting because we have a kind of another spying territory, right? So Joshua says, look, I'm going to send two spies out um, to the city. Go check it out. We're going to see if we can take it. He sends Caleb and Phineas, right? Two righteous men. And they come to the house of Rahab, right? And we know uh, with the story, one, I want to say there is a history of disenfranchisement towards female characters in Scripture. You have to understand that. Um, I, I forget the lady's name, but there's, uh, she's an author, and her whole thing is she goes through with all these historical uh, <coughs> ladies of the Bible and actually talks about like who, like some of these female apostles and all this stuff, and that she shows historically how they have been discredited. Yeah. Um, I think it's it's very interesting that Rahab has always been known as Rahab the harlot, right? Um, and now they say, well, she was a harlot. She was also an innkeeper, right? Like she ran her. She she was the the proctor of her own brothel, Man. so to speak. And so it's just, I don't know, it, it gets very interesting, but all that aside, we have a contrast to this story, uh, to the 12 spy story in, in this thing from Joshua. And what happens? The two spies, they come to Rahab's place and they say, look, we're going to come, we're going to take the city. Right? That was the report that they were giving to her. Right? We're going to come conquer the city. And she's like, okay, um, I believe you, first of all. And I tell you what, the king's looking for you, so I'm going to help you get out of here so you can get back to your people. Okay? Rahab believed the report of the spies, just like they believed the report of the spies before. It's contrast, right? She took it on faith, and her entire household was delivered. Whereas they believed the report of the spies... And they, they abandoned faith. It's this interesting contrast. Completely the other side of the spectrum. And this is really interesting. I never, I never noticed this before. But what happened? When she got the spies out of there, what, what did they tell her to do? Hang a scarlet cord from one of the windows so we can identify your place. And when we come in, we'll know that that's, that's a place to not mess with. Right? This is interesting. She did all this on faith. When the people were taken out of Egypt, what were they told to do? To slaughter a lamb, which points to Yeshua, we know that, but to slaughter a lamb and take its blood and paint it on the lintel and the doorpost, the red blood on the door, to mark their home. They had to do that on faith. She hung a scarlet cord, marking it as a place of safety, just like the blood on the door and the lintel, marked it as a place of safety. So when the destroyer, Rahab's house was marked and passed over by the destroyer, which in this case was the forces of Israel when they came in to conquer the city, her house was passed over. She was saved on the basis of her faith, believing the report of the spies. Whereas the Israelites, in the case of the ten spies, they believed the report and abandoned faith. Now, a few other things to note, and this is where I take issue with Rahab being a, uh, a prostitute. Scripture tells us in Matthew chapter 1, verses 5 through 6, she became the wife of Salmon, yes. who was a prince yes. of the tribe of Judah. Yes. Now this is interesting. We have a Gentile prostitute Black. who marries a prince 
of Judah. He wasn't just regular, you know, back 40 part of Judah, right? You know, goat herder Judah. He was the a prince of Judah. One of these leaders. We could argue that he probably had the pick of the women of his entire tribe. And he can't find anything better than a Gentile prostitute to marry. I find that very interesting. Even with all the scriptural prohibitions against marrying a prostitute and not going into her house. Right? Furthermore, to add to that, we have in the issue of a righteous man marrying a prostitute, right, with Hosea and Gomer. Right? But this was a very distinct. Hosea was commanded by the Lord to do this thing. We don't see that with sound. We've got no record of that. Well, one of the things, if I could, please. Mm -hmm. One of the things that we, uh, we, we, if we took a look, we'd see that the word Rahab, that may not have even been her, her name. name. Yeah. And the word Rahab means broad way. Because you know the the, uh, the top of the, the top of the city had twelve lanes for chariots. Okay. Okay. Or the word means outcropping or penthouse. Mm -hmm. um, scripture clearly says that her house was a penthouse. It was hanging off the side of the wall. Yeah. And so Rahab may not even been her name. Yeah. We don't even know that for sure. Oh. And you know, once again, specifically as this pastor is saying. The, uh, the, whole, the whole story about this woman is crystal clear in Scripture. She was an innkeeper. If, if she was a hard up in the hardest houses around the world, uh, and if she's an innkeeper, that the word means innkeeper. Mm -hmm. Now, what happened, what happened is that Jefferson, in, in, uh, in, in 1585, decided he needed to spice the Scripture up a little bit. Uh -huh. The Third World Church Conference told him, said, hey, look, you know, don't, don't be playing with this. And he said, no, nah, we got to spice it up a little bit. Uh -huh. How did he get away with it? He owned a printing press. Mm -hmm. I'm going to answer to God something, though, because so, said, don't add to my word. So, you know, scriptures, <laughs> scriptures perfectly, because she was a Proverbs 30, 31 woman. Yeah. And she, she had a job, she had an enterprise, she had her own place. You know, and there's, there's no prostitution involved. So. Yeah, yeah, it, it gets, it, when you really examine it, things don't line up. So, But it's, uh, furthermore, her lineage. She was the mother of Boaz, who was the great-grandmother of King David, placing her directly in the lineage of Yeshua. Yes. So, thought that would be interesting to know. Uh, the Brit Hadashah, Hebrews chapter 3, verses 7 uh, through chapter 4, verse 1. That is a warning for followers of Yeshua to exercise faith versus unbelief. Let's take a quick look at that before we close. Hebrews chapter 3, verse 7. Um, let's actually, let's read verse 12. It says, watch out, brothers, so that there will not be in any one of you an evil heart lacking trust, which could lead you to apostatize from the living God. Again, unbelief. When God promises something, when we say, no, I don't, I don't that's not going to work. That's unbelief. And what does this passage tell us? If we, if we do that, if we have an evil heart, right? An evil heart of unbelief. That's how God sees it. That will lead us to apostatize from the Lord. Because if you start disbelieving one promise, then you'll disbelieve another promise, and another promise, and you'll get to the point where I can't believe anything in this book. Because I was let down here, here, and here, and here. Question is, these times when God has let us down, what was really going on there? Were we looking with our perception? Were we seeing from his point of view? This hit home for me this week.
Father's Day, I spent my Father's Day tearing apart our refrigerator because they just decided to quit working. This is not convenient. <laughs> it never is. Right? So we're scrambling, okay, we'll put some food in the freezer. We, thankfully, we had a beat up old fridge in the garage. Thank you, Lord, for provision. We're able to get through it. But, you know, I'm dealing with that. So, and then, you know, work week starts. Work is crazy. I'm working overtime. We're super busy. In the back of my mind, I've got a busted fridge at home. And then on my way home, the dash on the van starts blinking. Check charging system. <laughs> Alternator goes out in the minivan. I gotta fix this too. When it rains, it pours. Yeah, and I'm just, and I'm kind of, I'm kind of, you know, crying in my Cheerios here to the Lord. I'm like, what's going on? Same like he's writing a message. Yeah. And our anniversary. Yeah, and our anniversary. It's like everything in one week. And I'm just like, how am I, what's going on here? I'm like, did I like step out of your will and you like took your hand of protection off my life or something? What's going on? But then I calm down, and it's like, look, okay, fridge is old, it's an appliance, things break. The van, it's got 270,000 miles on it with the original alternator. Something's going to go out at some point. When stuff breaks, it's never convenient. It doesn't mean God has abandoned me. He hasn't lifted his hand of protection off my life. It's just life stuff. How do I know God's still with me? I have money in my bank account, I can order the part. He's given me intelligence to be able to research and figure out how to fix the refrigerator, right? I can jump online and order the car part, and when it comes in, I can fix it, right? Is it inconvenient? Yes. But God's blessing and protection does not always equate to convenience in every situation in our life, right? So again, I can throw my hands up, God's abandoned me, all right, I'm outside his will, all this stuff's going on. Or, I can say, you know what? That's just stuff, it's just life, stuff happens. But he's given me provision to be able to handle these things. Thank you, Lord. So he is with me. Because he promised he would be with me. Even if I didn't have these things to take care of this stuff, right? He's still with me. Because my car doesn't work, God has abandoned me. Give me a break. But, but that's a temptation, though, right? We want to whine about these things. And, oh, woe is me. We have to see from God's perspective. I like this. Um, I do a lot of study from Hebrews for Christians, that website. I like a lot of their material. And they put it like this. It says, those who are called to follow Yeshua must enter into the kingdom by faith and not by relying on the spying eyes of the flesh. I thought that was a really neat tie-in. That's why we wear tassels, to remember, keep our faith. Not just the commandments. It is about that, but not just that. And it's not just an outward identification, although it is that. But remember, put him first, his perspective, his view. Walk in faith, not by sight. If I walk by sight, it looks like this week, like God has left the building. <laughs> can't walk by sight. The fridge is working now. Yes, the fridge is working now. Thank you, Lord. <laughs> to repair work, so I'm happy about that. I woke up this morning, I'm like, it's cold. <laughs> <laughs> it's, a, it's a big deal. Yeah, it's a big deal. Now it's nice and clean, and it's working. So the sin of presumption is a reoccurring theme in Scripture. We will see this. This sin traces its root all the way back to the Garden of Eden, where man, operating from a faulty perception given by the deceiver, right? What did the deceiver say? You'll be just like God. Adam, Eve, God has been holding out on you got this tree, all this wisdom, all this knowledge, right? You could be just like God. Why doesn't he want you to be like him? Right? All you got to do is eat from the tree, and he's telling you not to do it. He tempted them with 
with a faulty perception. If they would have thought about it, I don't know if I want to be like God and have all that responsibility and have that weight. I'm not designed and built to carry that. Operating from a faulty perception given by the deceiver, they thrust the world into irrevocable sin. Due to the nature of God's name, Nake, right? He can't let sin go unpunished. Yet in his grace and mercy, he sent a Savior to redeem us from eternal destruction. So it falls to us to place our faith in our Redeemer, Yeshua. Abandoning our perceptions that are in conflict with the Father's will and spiritually appending that yod to our name, right? To put that yod in front of our name. To remember to place the Lord first in all that we do. That's how we walk. That's how we live righteously before our God. Remember his ways, his perception. He's the creator. Right? He's the creator. He's the author and finisher of our faith. We can choose to rebel. We can choose to go a different direction. He gives us free will. But it's like anything else. The manufacturer retains the right to tell how that thing is supposed to work. They designed it. They built it. It works this way. You want to deviate from that, that's your business. But when it breaks down, don't come crying. God gave us instructions. He manufactured us. He built us. He designed us. This is how you are supposed to operate. You want to do something different? Go ahead. But when things fall apart, what do you want me to say? So that is our core portion this week. Hopefully you guys got some new insights out of it. And it's been a blessing to you. We all have our calendars and we will meet again very soon. Um, we're usually pretty good about getting the uh, tour portions on band so that way you can read them because we do go through them but it's you know again our position is you should be reading these prior to our gatherings so that way we're all kind of on the same page yeah they're on the calendar too so but um, I hope you all have a blessed week and then uh, we'll see you guys again Shabbat Shalom